My buddy Eric Hunley is here to bring us up to speed on the Alec Baldwin shooting investigation, which Eric, you are covering in depth on your new channel, um, America's Untold Stories. And if everybody wants to go find the playlist where he and Mark Rivera have had gone over this case, probably better than anyone else, definitely better than mainstream media, go check them out and subscribe. Um, you're calling it Alec Baldwin and the Russ tragedy. So this is part one. I'll just play this without sound, Eric, and you can maybe just run us through the Reader's Digest version real fast before we get into the updates. Okay, the high level, and thanks for having me, by the way. Yeah. High level overview is Alec Baldwin was on a movie set and on this set, the director of photography or cinematographer, Helena Hutchins, died. And the director of the movie was shot in the shoulder, um, supposedly by the same bullet. This has led into a complete catastrophic investigation or a mess, if you will. There are so many things going on because people don't just get shot on a set. It's highly unusual. Uh, the first case that I can think of is John Eric Hexum, who died in the 80s when he took a pistol to his head with a blank in it, and the blank had enough pressure that it was enough to kill him. Then Brandon Lee of the Crow died in the 90s, and that was a freak incident where a dummy round got caught in the barrel, and then a blank behind it fired the dummy round into him, and that killed him. So this is the third actual shooting on a set. Now, what's happened with this, though, is how does somebody get shot on a set? There's a lot of misconceptions out there. And the first thing we wanted to do, because Mark has worked with movies forever, he is a um, co-writing partner with Oliver Stone. The movie The Recruit is his movie. He wrote the original story. And on down the line, he's on the sets, he's a location manager. He has a lot of time on this. A lot of people are saying that a prop gun malfunctioned or misfired. And everybody said, well, how's that possible? And they were thinking that a prop gun is a fake gun. First rule is a prop gun is a gun that is controlled by the property department of a movie. So we had to get that out the right way. It is literally a gun. A gun can be used with a bullet, a blank, a dummy, empty, but it is, in fact, a real gun. Then you have the problem of how did live ammo get on that set? How did live ammo get into that gun? This is still going on. This is still the case. And where this is all started from, our first episode, we talked about it. And early on, I pulled up a picture here. This is Hannah Gutierrez Reed. And Hannah is the armorer on the movie. She's very young. She's 24 years old. And we started out wondering if perhaps Hannah was not mature enough or skilled enough to actually be the armorer on the set. And there's a lot of pictures out there like this that, people have used, et cetera, to say, hey, there's an interesting maturity um, question about whether she did do it. The um, theory that we put up was that it might be nepotism. If you look at the gentleman on your right, that there is Thel Reed. Thel Reed is her father. Thel Reed goes all the way back to Gunsmoke and is a fast draw artist and gun play artist, all of that. And he is a legend in Hollywood. He's worked with Quentin Tarantino, Russell Crowe, Mel Gibson, pretty much any high level movie that involved gunplay, you will find Thel Reed. And that is who we thought recommended Hannah to, be, to have the job. So there was a question of, okay, was it a nepotism problem? She wasn't mature enough? What? Well, it may not be the problem. We don't know. So the next person who was involved in the situation is Dave Halls. 
if you have any questions, you know, definitely pop up and ask because I understand that it all can get really confusing really quickly. Well, the only the only thing I was thinking of while you were showing her picture is that uh, I've I've interviewed quite a few. Well, let's just say I've interviewed in one in particular a uh, gun model. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, if I would trust her necessarily, like if she had a gun pointed to my head. Uh, but I have seen pictures like the ones you just showed me, but even probably more um, revealing. And I can assure you that woman has um, has had a lot of responsibility around guns and is a veteran. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I, I always play devil's advocate on that side. Like, well you know, there's, there are women out there that pose with guns and bikinis all the time. Oh, yeah. They may be, you know, oh, yeah, they may yeah, yeah, be yeah. very highly skilled with guns. Yes. And, and, and that's where we'll happily talk about that because part of the reason that there's that question, and by the way, it's still out there too, is that she appeared on a podcast saying that this is her second movie that she was an armorer on, that she came from the wardrobe department and she didn't know that she was really qualified or not. So this is out of her own mouth on a podcast. Now, as of this moment, her father was on Good Morning America this morning. And he's saying, oh, no, I've had her with me my entire life. She's been, or her entire life, sorry. She's been on sets and show pictures, you know, of him carrying her around when she was like 10 years old on a set. So you and I both know we're of, um, now, I don't know if we're rural background, but we have friends who are rural. And I handled guns as a child. And I know many, many people who did handle guns as a kid who are quite qualified with guns. So mm -hmm. it's entirely possible, but I'm just, I'm kind of giving the narrative and painting the timeline as best I can to catch you up. Gotcha. So this guy right here, this is Dave Halls. Uh, Dave Halls is the first AD. What he does that mean? Uh, first assistant director. Okay. Now I don't know. I know you work uh, different film and stuff, but I, I don't know how familiar you are with sets. No, none. Okay. Um, first AD, if you we were going to use a military analogy, he is like the first sergeant. Okay. You, the director's the company commander. It's the director's movie. The first AD is the guy with a walkie talkie who gets everybody in position. He's the one saying, I need an actor over here. I got to get the lighting over here. And he is like the traffic cop of everything that's going on. It's a very, very high stress job, really important role. And just making all, making sure all the players in the proper place and doing the proper job. Well, I'm not, I'm also not uh, as familiar with the military order, despite the fact I've been married to a veteran for a while. However, <laughs> he has told me I would make a great Lance Corporal, which I do not think is a compliment. <laughs> okay. Uh, first Sergeant's about that, but it, it, it is along that line. I mean, you, you have okay. the officer says, I want to do this. And then the first sergeant gets all the troops in place. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, makes it all happen. It was it, cop, <laughs> cop, whatever you want. But anyway, he is the one who actually handed the gun to Alec Baldwin. Hmm. And therein lies part of the problem here. Because you have an armorer, you know, the person who's technically in charge of the weapon and responsible for it. And by most accounts, she should have been handing the gun to Alec Baldwin. Okay. So we've got a break in the chain of custody here, if you will. Now, Alec Baldwin, during the interview with Stephanopoulos, stated that it was either her or the assistant director. And when he got pushed back on, he said, well, 99.9999% of the time, it's her. But this mm -hmm. one time, it was Dave Hall's. Did, did anyone, I'm sorry, because I've, I've been very busy with a very sick horse uh, and mm -hmm. have not seen the entirety of that interview. Did they ever get into why he, as the person who would then be firing the gun, uh, did he, did he, you know, fire it towards, I don't know, into some, something, do they, do they check it to see that there's nothing, there's no bullet coming they did out? Not check it. And th there, there, this is part of the whole mess. Um, Alec Baldwin is an A-lister and there are two types of A-listers and having Mark on, you know, who's been around all these people and stuff, he'll tell you that you have the Clooney's George Clooney, who says, I check it every time. I don't care what I always check the weapon. Alec Baldwin is saying, it's not my job. 
to do that. Oh. To, you, you know, you have a safety professional. And he even stated that when he was young in the interview that they told him, uh, we don't want you to be the last point of safety. You know, you can, because some actors claim, you know, they point it to the ground and go bang, 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 bang. Well, that's actually dangerous too. What if yeah. it's concrete and it's going to ricochet, you know, whatever. Right. They're saying, you know, we're the professionals. You let us handle it. And so that's kind of the, the side that Alec Baldwin is on. There's huge conflict there. So you have John Schneider who's saying that's rubbish. And a lot of this does pivot on whether people like Alec Baldwin or not. I, I mean, obviously, there's. Some I'm just of that. saying, maybe this is why I don't work in Hollywood. But if I was going to have a gun pointed and fired in mm -hmm. my direction, I would want to witness myself that you have checked it multiple times. Um, mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, when I was asking about firing it to make sure there were no rounds in there, I didn't mean like in the ground, but mm -hmm. I would just think like you would set up something that you could have that would be a safe way for like just the whole crowd. Like we've done another check. Like you've, everyone's behind the line. We're showing every, there's nothing in here. I don't know. I just, I well, would ideally you open it, you pull the bullets and look yeah, and say, are they blanks? Are they bullets? Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I understand that. And you and I have a background. We would be most likely to do that, but I'm just trying, I'm trying to be fair all around. And that's one of the things we're trying to do in the series is. It just seems, it honest. seems like, it just seems like, um, I don't know what Lynn, my husband calls it change blindness or something, or just, you just get used to this just being the way it is. And you just assume mm -hmm. everything's going to be fine. And you get used to having somebody point a gun at you and shoot right. without necessarily seeing like, I don't know, for me, I guess maybe that just makes me paranoid or, or smart, but I wouldn't, I just, I just would not trust the process enough if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. I just, I, it's fascinating to me, I guess that and maybe that T Eric, it is, it is a reflection of, of just how the SOPs are and just everybody expects it to go exactly the same way every single time. And and you do your thing and I do my thing and we're all in our place. And, you know, that's just the way it is. And I know that, you know, sometimes that's even a reflection of just highly unionized industries too. Like this is just what everybody does. We don't, we don't, I don't edit your stuff. You don't shoot my stuff. And that's, that's just how it works. But it's just interesting to me. Um, that more doesn't go wrong, you know, I guess I, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of surprised that, that it's as rare as it is. And it is extremely rare. I mean, that, that is a fact that he did say, and, and it's been pointed out multiple times in the, in the comments, by the way, the whole, okay, Alec, if, uh, if the scene was for you to point the gun at your head, like deer hunter, would you check it then? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that is a good legitimate question, but yes, yeah, it is an extraordinarily rare thing to occur. Um, hundreds of millions, potentially billions of bullets have flown, you know, or, or simulated flowing in Hollywood for the past, you know, decades. But, but you're saying basically, even now, we still don't know a hundred percent who was the last line of defense on this gun. That's what we're trying to still figure out because literally I have an episode coming out tomorrow with Mark we're back to the question of sabotage. Now, this is where, like I said, everything is crazy in this case. It seems very simple. Okay, there's this, there's this, there's a gun. It went off, boom. Oh, no. Nothing simple about this. Because the set had the camera crew walk off and quit. Literally, like the night before. The, mm -hmm. um, the camera person wrote a letter citing safety concerns, saying in the gunfights that there were rounds that went off um, in the past few days before. Ooh. So they quit. There's an argument saying, oh, well, it really was that they didn't like the hotel room and they didn't like the driving distance. And that did come up. And that sowed confusion. Alec Baldwin, obviously, I'm going to say, obviously, I'm going to go with Robert Barnes on this, had a crisis communication team because all kinds of headlines were, you know, flying out at the time. This is happening. This is happening. This is happening. And like he retweeted that Dave Hall said, I should have checked the gun, but he didn't. And I'm like, oh, throw your buddy under the bus. But is a question, you know, like how safe was the set? Everything was nuts. She was, you know, there at the last minute with the camera. And then you come to the Alec Baldwin interview. And we can always go back to any other point in the timeline if you wish. But in the interview, it's very interesting what happened. And 
Mark came up with the this theory in talking about it that she she was micromanaging Alec Baldwin to a degree in terms of Baldwin is an A-lister. Now people are going to argue, well, he's not my A-lister or whatever, but he is an A-list actor. And they were preparing, I, I forget what he said. It was not like a block rehearsal, but it was like for, you know, lining things up, you know, getting in position, do this, do this, do this, do that. And I guess she was saying, you know, point the gun over there, put it over there, turn over here, turn over there. That is not a standard thing for a cinematographer or director of photography to tell an actor. The normal chain of events is for a cinematographer to be looking, you know, inside the camera or whatever and saying, I can't see his hand. It's, it's out of frame. And then the director saying, Hey, Alec, can you pull your hand back a little bit to be in the frame? Or can you turn to the side? Or she say, Oh, you know, I, I can't, the light is wrong. Can you move the light? You know, and then, and then the director would say, that is a normal course of action. But apparently she was telling Alec, do this, do this, do this, do this. And he described that in the interview and he did it in a, a, a polite way. But the question is, as Mark brought it up initially, this is highly unusual. Why was she doing that? Where was the director? Because the director was there. He had to be there. He got shot. Somehow a bullet got into him. So he had to be there at the time. What was he doing during this time? And Alec Baldwin has a 25-year record of complaining about weak directors. <laughs> he also is well-known for his temper. Mm. Very well-known for his temper. Everything from yelling at his daughter to paparazzi, things like that. So Mark has pointed it out how this is going on. And he has this you know, female with a Russian accent telling him what to do. The director's not telling this A-lister what to do. For a shot that may not even make it in the movie. And Alec during the interview also said, this may not make it into the movie. And the question is, as Mark put it, why, you know, why was she telling him? Why is it going on? And Alec described it as, I have to pull the hammer back in this scene too. Do you want me to do that? And she said, yes. And he said, okay, do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? And that was an unusual thing because anybody could do that. Any stand in, you know, it's a, it's a hand and a gun. Who, who cares? The question is why was an A-lister doing this? Why was a director of photography telling him to do that? That was all in the interview. And Mark was saying he was probably very annoying. He might've pulled the trigger. David, our friend, Viva Fry, ran, has run with it and has pointed out all of this together and has put forth and continued the theory that Alec was saying, do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? And then just pulled the trigger, you know, to let the hammer go back down, not knowing that there was a bullet in there. What, what I am still confused about is what are the thoughts about why there were bullets on set for this gun in the first place. Is that normal? It is. Okay. This is where it gets confusing too. Technically there should never be live ammunition on the set. However, the fact is that these armorers or weapons masters will take actors out and go shooting with them to give them experience in using the weapon. So you know, set up a range on the side and then go out there and then shoot at targets, cans, whatever it might be. You know, they called it plinking. And there were, you know, comments about plinking going on during lunch and, you know, at the time. So did, do they ahead. ever have somebody like my husband who's there just for safety purposes, who's like not part of the the set, not part of the the crew that's just there to check the firearms as like a safety instructor or a safety. That's the armorer. That's technically what the armorer is supposed to be. I see. And again, like Thel Reed, you see, this is not a Thel Reed movie. Thel Reed, who has handled every gun and I think had the world record as the fastest draw and all, all that. I mean, you cannot get any more knowledgeable about the pistols, how they work and, and the safety, all the protocols and everything else in Thel Reed. This is his daughter. Now, 
mm-hmm. coming back to Thel, the legend, and his daughter, it comes to be that it wasn't Thel who had her um, hired. And it was not her who provided the guns. There was someone else involved. Now, this is where it gets very interesting. And we jokingly say this during the show when we have inside information, we can't say exactly where it comes from, that a bottle has floated in. So (laughs) I got this letter in a bottle. And this letter is from the attorneys to a Seth Kinney. Seth Kinney runs or owns PDQ Media Arm and Prop and is a federal firearms dealer in uh, both Arizona and New Mexico. And maybe in California too, I'm not sure. But he's been around a long time. He worked in the biggest prop house in California for a long, long time. Uh, Is a dealer. He provided all of the guns to the production. And the theory is that he may have recommended Hannah Reed to the movie. I'm not I'm not sure on that one, but that is kind of what has come out later and been implied in articles. And the reason why I'm saying I'm not sure is, well, you and I talk about media all the time, right? This is a cease and desist letter from Seth Kinney and his lawyers to the LA Times saying that they're demanding a retraction. Hmm. And this is where things get crazy. Mark and I found the budget to the movie and we found on it that there was the armorer and then the armorer crew. And we're saying, who the hell's the crew? And there was none. Then all of a sudden there's articles coming out about Seth Kinney being the crew and being of all things, this that nobody had ever heard of before an armor mentor. Hmm. Now this is a really interesting term because, you know, ironically, Mark actually had never heard the term armorer before with the movie. They have um, a weapons master or weapons handler, but the term armorer is not necessarily universally used. And that's that's yeah. something that came up in the Stephanopoulos interview with uh, Baldwin as well, that he had never heard term the term armorer, even though I had Gavin look at it. He seemed he may have showed some deceit at the time, so we're not sure. But nobody had heard of the term armorer mentor. What is that? We don't know. And I had speculated on it that maybe it was uh, because of his uh, firearms license, that it was you know part of the umbrella or, or whatever. I, I did not know. Well, this is from Seth Kinney and his lawyer saying, no, he is not the armor mentor, and uh, he's going to sue you if you keep calling him that. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm going to say that perhaps that is not a good label for that. And Seth Kinney was part of a contact list, he's claiming but not a crew member and they're not the same thing and Mm -hmm. and that's fair i mean a a contact is not necessarily on the crew and he was not hired to supervise miss gutierrez reed the last Mm -hmm. one is interesting he's saying that the pdq arm and prop licensed the weapons to rust not mr kenny that one, I, I'm just guessing that's a corporate liability point that's being brought up that it was his company that did it. He didn't personally do this, but I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know all the details on that. But this is. Uh, what do you think is the significance of this letter, big picture for the investigation? For the investigation, I just think it's important to understand or know who the players actually are or, or try to know who they are because everything is being thrown out there so much, you know, like what, what's an armor or mentor oh, is, mm-hmm. is that person at fault? Are they not at fault? And keep in mind that all kinds of fingers are flying because now mm-hmm. here's some very recent developments. You have Thel Reed and these, these people, they know each other. Okay. Thel Reed, mm-hmm. her father knows Seth, Seth Kenny. I don't think it's really a big circle, you know, weapons experts in Hollywood. They know each other. 
Well, Thel Reed claims that he was working on another movie with Seth Kinney. And they were using live rounds to train the actors. So th th this is proof that it is happening on other movies that there's mm -hmm. you know live rounds going around. But he's he claimed that Seth Kinney had the live rounds but did not return the live rounds to him. The FBI recently has conducted a um, search warrant. Is that what you call it, conducting it? Or carried out a search Works warrant? For me. On uh, PDQ Arms, Seth Kinney's establishment, and they did retrieve live ammo from the establishment. But Seth Kinney is claiming that the live ammo is similar, but not the same. It was just close enough for them to take it. Hmm. You know, again, I don't know exactly what that means, but that's what has been put out there. Now, as of this morning, Thel Reed came on to Good Morning America with Hannah Gutierrez's Re Reed's attorney, and he's been saying from day one that this is sabotage. Hmm. And Thel Reed is saying, yeah, um, my daughter, there's no way that would have happened if she had handed the gun to Alec Baldwin. She would have checked it. That it should not have been. You know, so we're kind of going right back to the beginning right. of it all. And he's saying, uh, no way she knows. I taught her everything I know. She's better than I am now. Um, blah, blah, blah. The other problem is that she had two jobs in the movie. She was not only the armor, but she was also the assistant prop master. So it was like if she wasn't busy doing armor stuff, then she had to go run off and do other tasks. So th this yeah. is another safety concern. Right. But anyway, they're claiming through her lawyer that the, the safety all the havoc, all the problems, all the strife and the anger and, and upset people that somebody dropped bullet in there to sabotage things. Did so who did who did they want to harm? The person or people who got shot, Alec Baldwin, or the person who would normally be held responsible for handing over the gun? Like who who was the target in all of if that the if there was a saboteur? I think that in my mind, and this is pure speculation, okay. If that story is true. I believe the target would be the production itself that there were problems with union members versus non-union members and people who are crying and, or, you know, saying that is a, a bad safety situation. I didn't mean to say crying despairingly. I'm just saying they were complaining about safety concerns, things like that. I can see in my crafty little mind a scenario that you have somebody who says this is a dangerous set bad things are happening i'll tell you what i know they were shooting these uh, rounds you know they're plinking at lunch or whatever they know where they are they just grab a couple of them and they go to st they stick them in the in the dummy box figuring that nobody's going to get hurt they're going to get discovered on the way or even if they fire you know they'd be at a wall or something not thinking of this chain of events that could occur here with the idea that then they could yell later, look, those are live rounds. How did those get there? How did that happen? And then they scream up an alarm and show that it's a bad, you know, unsafe set. That That's a possibility. I don't know. Yeah, I, I could see that. I would also question, though, anybody in their right mind thinking that they would do that and it couldn't possibly end up in someone's death. You know, I, it would just seem so stupid to mm -hmm. assume it was just going to end with someone going, Oh crap, there's live rounds in here. Or if they shoot a wall or something like if I set an explosive device somewhere, gonna, Oh yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. It's I mean like, it's, it's, uh, but uh, it's so stupid. It's scary. But what if, I mean, let's just t play my scenario because it is, it's just a BS scenario. There's no, I'm, I'm not saying it actually happened. I'm just saying it. If we are writing a book, this could be a story, but they put it in there and they plan to notice it later. Hmm. But then things get, uh, things are running behind. You know, the armor is going to hand him the gun, but the armor is not there. She's off in the prop shop. So you don't know that the gun yeah. actually got moved over to the AD to Alec Baldwin. So you don't even have the, the cue to go, Hey, wait a minute. What's going on with that gun there or whatever. And then all of a sudden it it's gone. It, everything just went out. Do you think, somebody or 
more than are letting on know what happened and they're just not revealing it? Or do you think everyone is as confused as they're pretending or uh, purporting to be? I don't want to say pretend because that means that they they know it's different, but everyone's acting like, you know, it's not my fault. I didn't do it. I don't know how this happened. Do you think there are more people who actually do know and they're they're just pointing fingers uh, or do you think it, this is genuine, this confusion? I, I think that we definitely have people who are holding back things. And I'll give you the biggest one, okay? Alec Baldwin claims that he didn't pull the trigger. Really? Yeah. Oh, See, your that. reaction <laughs> your reaction is exactly what I was waiting for. You've been around guns. He didn't pull the trigger. It, it just went off. He, he pulled the hammer back, and let it go, and it went off. That's his claim. Dave Halls, the first assistant director, claims that no, Alec did not have his finger on the trigger. Now, it is possible, but extremely remote that that could happen. And I'll, I'll just say that um, I, a source that I have pointed out that the weapons used, if are functional, that is impossible. They would have to either be modified or damaged in some way. And by the way, they're in with the FBI. So the FBI will have to determine Mm -hmm. this but now let's say that no that's not the case it was really just a, a trigger pull for whatever reason if you forgot you know short term memory a lot of people skinner on the line and you have the assistant director who handed the unchecked gun to alec baldwin so now we have two people who are sharing culpability here right so it might behoove one to say yeah 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 that's right yeah, that exactly what happened. You know, so we, I don't know. And then there's other, you know, factors uh, where you have the person who called nine one one. Um, we we talked a little bit about that situation. You know, whether how much damage is really there? Is this more about a Gloria Allred suit? Because you bring Gloria Allred into the picture, what do you have? Well, obviously, you're bringing it to another level of of uh, circus syndrome, and it's just. It's nuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is completely nuts. It reminds me of this saying that I heard my parents say a lot as physicians. They were trained that if you hear hoof beats or hoof, you know, the sound of hooves coming from behind you, think horse, not zebra, because it's most likely a horse. That's, a, that's like mm -hmm. what they teach you in medicine diagnostics, right? It's typically like go to horse first and then think zebra. So it just seems like, it seems like, <laughs> this is all going to the zebra and <laughs> the obvious thing that I don't know, I, even, even the idea that Alec Baldwin didn't pull the trigger and it just seems so I, I, confusing would be, would be an understatement. I think at this point, it's so weird to me that, that this investigation is going the way that it is. And I it have to ask it. myself if it's because of the high profile nature of Baldwin himself and if this would be going differently if it was just a normal average citizen I I as a, re mm -hmm. a reporter I just I don't know there were there were very very few if any cases of this kind of of just I don't know it should have could have been this and it could have been that and it you know, they're just it just rarely if ever happened even in these weird cases where you find out it was the, the daughter trying to to get the inheritance or whatever and mm. there was a sinister reason for it, things that because normally when we're talking murder it, or homicide it's it's typically very simple it's not there's not usually all these sort of innate plans for it and what someone's going to get out of it and and um so even if it was of that level just just the fact that everybody's like the three stooges like wasn't me it wasn't me it was that guy that guy and you're just it just something's something's very fishy here for me just i just i just rarely ever hear about cases i i, I certainly never covered a case where it was like this confusing you know mm -hmm. and so so to me even the investigators i feel like must know something that we're just not hearing well again and part of this uh, again crisis communications team a lot of money a lot of power you have a, a soros um backed da with um 
Alec Baldwin, friend of the Clintons. Not, I mean, <laughs> there's so many politics involved here. You are absolutely right. His high profile does matter. If this was Joe Smith actor, it probably would have been taken away, locked up right then, or, you know, there'd just be an investigation. Nobody would be talking about it too deeply. You wouldn't be going on with George Stephanopoulos. Again, back to Clinton, former chief of staff, George Stephanopoulos' wife, co-starred with Alec Baldwin in a movie. Anyway, there, there's so many crazy right. ties. And then I'll, I'll give you one little t taster of it. Al Alec Baldwin pointed out that he did have a 90-minute session with Hannah, um, Hannah Reed, um, when he got on the set on and was shooting the gun. Now, he didn't say it was blanks, bullets, or otherwise, but what do you do for 90 minutes? You're out yeah. shooting. Right. And he said that she was teaching him how to understand recoil, right? Mm -hmm. That with a blank, you have to, you have to do it. And he, he expressed in the interview that you have to pull it up yourself to get the difference of the recoil. This same Alec Baldwin later on talking about when the shooting occurred said that he didn't know she was shot. He thought she might have fainted. Wow. Have you been around a 45 caliber pistol that has been fired and you have a director screaming in the background? Alec Baldwin said that he was screaming in the background and you go, I wonder if she fainted. And I'm thinking maybe you would have noticed the recoil that, you know, she supposedly was teaching the difference because there are damn sure would be a 45 caliber recoil. I fired 45 calibers. There's a recoil. And then he stood over her for like 60 seconds and did not know that she was actually shot for 45 minutes. The interview is a prize for the behavior panel and they covered it. So it's, it, 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 this is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, Tomorrow, we're actually going to be doing the sabotage angle because of Thel Re coming out and everything else and the lawyer, and we're going to explore sabotage because we're going back to that. Eric, I appreciate it. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about this crazy case before you go? It's insane. <laughs> There's nothing else to tell. Please come by and check it out. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's good to have people like you all who are willing to keep digging into it, because as you brought up, even if you have somebody like Stephanopoulos interviewing Baldwin, and so we're hearing from Baldwin, you know, that's a softball interview, given the connections. And the reason that he was willing to do that interview was because he knew he wasn't going to get a whole lot of tough questions. So probably knew the questions ahead of time and agreed to them. It would be my guess. Mm -hmm. And there's also really odd jump cuts throughout it. If you yeah. watch it, you'll see that too. It's like, yeah. Okay. Mm. Eric Hundley, thanks again. Everybody go check out America's Untold Stories and uh, we'll see you next time. Oh, and of course, News with Booze, which we do on Eric's channel at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern time every Wednesday night. As long as I'm not dealing with a sick horse, sick child, or any other number of crises that happen out, out here in uh, the Morrow Studios. <laughs> thanks, Eric. <laughs>